There's a technique that John uses in his gospel where in his sort of sermon forms, just like the one we heard this morning, he's not just merely addressing his historic audience, in this case the Pharisees. He's also addressing the reader. In fact, there are times in the gospel where you almost get the impression that Jesus is talking to someone in the context of the story, and just as if it were a play, he turns to the audience and says something to them, almost quite apart from the conversation that's happening over here. This, however, is one of those times where he addresses both the Pharisees as well as the readers, us. What's the, the context? Well, I, I think probably the best way I can get at that is how do I find myself in that audience being addressed in the way that Jesus is addressing the Pharisees? You see, the dilemma is this. The dilemma is I have a certain picture of who God is. I poured over the scriptures to figure out what that concept is and I've accepted it fully and wholeheartedly. In fact, I've staked my life on it. That's a fair assessment of the Pharisees. They, they're not in and of themselves, you see, ignorant or unlearned, or even for that matter, sort of treacherous people at one level. They, they're committed to doing their job. And their job is to uphold the law of Moses. Their job is to uphold that which they have received as an accurate picture of who God is and what God asks of his people. Jesus shows up and says, actually, you don't even believe Moses because Moses spoke of me. Cryptic last line in the gospel, if you could believe what Moses had wrote, you would believe what I say, but because you don't believe what Moses wrote, I can hear them going, what do you mean I don't believe what Moses wrote? I've given everything I have to this. Same here, you see. I think how I find myself in this audience is that it is, in fact, possible for just because I live in a church, and I don't mean the Episcopal Church, I mean the body of Christ, that always teaches from a slightly refracted place just because of who we are as human beings. Nobody gets clean, pure light every time he opens his mouth or even every time he opens the Bible. So there is always an, a distinction between the truth of who God is in Jesus Christ and what I believe the scripture says about him and therefore what I believe. I'm, I'm always slightly off because that's just a part of what it means to, as Paul says, know in part. We don't get it all. We actually can't get it all just because of who we are. We're fallen human beings who have a limited capacity to understand divinity. It's like, does it have to be said so obviously? It's just us, you see. And, and so what happened, though, to them was they stood their ground in the tradition that they had received. And because they perceived Jesus as teaching and expressing something that was very different, from what they knew, because their commitment was to stand their ground and uphold that tradition, they rejected him. Jesus gets past that and says, you don't even believe your own tradition. Because actually, if you did, you, you'd believe in me. Because I'm the one Moses right around. So what, is, what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with us? I feel like it's exactly the same. It's possible, you see, to have a concept of God that as far as is possible in our broken situation to have some accuracy about doctrine and about practice, because that really is the heartbeat of what is going on, even in what the Pharisees believe. They have clear concepts about accurately about the oneness of God and about what God asks of his people in the law. But what is not there is 
relationship. Cranmer, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may truly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. That's, it was that relationship that gave Moses, in fact, God gave it to Moses, the capacity to step into the breach and intercede even in the midst of the apostasy of the people of Israel. Moses trusted God. That's a relational word. And that's what we don't see in the Gospels portrayal of the Pharisees. They do their best to be right and to teach rightly. But as Jesus even says at one point, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Which means when I get into biblical study, it is in fact, to I, I can search the scriptures. I can fulfill the fa fa Pharisaic ch the charge. Search the scriptures, get my doctrine right, try to think carefully and critically about what it is the scripture says, almost as an end in itself, as a scholarly um, enterprise. But if what's not happening in the midst of that is that, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, I am very dangerously close to moving into a place where I may have my doctrine right, but my relationship wrong. And that's the heartbeat of what I believe Jesus is speaking to his listeners. Is, I'm here for a relationship. Not a relationship that's in contradiction to doctor, of course, but a relationship first and foremost. Jesus' words to Peter after the resurrection, Peter, do you love me? Not Peter, do you? Do you understand now? No. Peter, do you love me? The trust, so that, and one other thing is I think about this. If I'm being taught out of this non-relational perspective on the scripture, what I'm actually giving myself as well as my hearers is not true bread, going back to the mm -hmm. collect. Because what happens when we feed on true bread, as Cranmer is very clear to say to us, is that evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him. It is cost possible to think rightly and not have that kind of lively interaction that kind of lively relationship where he is alive in me. So at this point, the prayer, as I stand with the Pharisees, the colleague, evermore give us this bread that you may live in me so that I am not counted among those who may be intellectually on point but relationally in a place of disaster. And I need God to get me there. I need the Lord to literally come into that crowd and take me by the arm and begin to walk with me as he did with the disciples on the road to Emmaus so that my heart burns within me. That's where the life is, you see. Not just pouring over the intellectual concepts or even the accuracy of doctrine. You see, you have to go there, it seems to me, to take the scripture seriously. Because the other way you go is actually that there must be something wrong with my intellectual pursuit. It takes you to quest for the historic Jesus, the, the Jesus seminar and things like that. How can we get past the layers of misunderstanding to get to where the real Jesus is? In other words, there's a problem with my method. Jesus is saying, no, there's a problem with your relationship. It's not method. It's relational. Evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him. So in this, as we approach the fourth Sunday, of the fifth Sunday of Lent, 
the introspective way of reading the Bible is a part of what's taking me here because if Lent has any kind of capacity to impart gift, it is that somehow the, de the depth of my relationship with God is expanded, that the relationship is more intimate, and that out of that love, I see more clearly. I understand more rightly. The intellectual pursuit in the capacity of Jesus Christ is never an end in itself. If it is not enabling me to love, it's idolatrous. Evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him. Amen. Amen.